Hi, my name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. You might not be realizing this, but it has been four episodes since my last rocket launch. Well, this cannot be allowed to continue, so you're going to be getting one right off the bat here. This is Arm B, which I'll talk about in just a sec. But uh, first thing I will be explaining is I am launching into an inclined orbit. It's going to be going to the south at about 40 degrees. The other hint as to what might be going on here is noticing that it is a night launch. I normally don't like doing night launches, but perhaps uh, there's a particular launch window I need to hit. Maybe there's something in particular I need to rendezvous with, but we are off in the meantime. And actually, I guess one major hint is that contract that's over there on the side. If we take a little bit of a closer look at it, you will see that it is a contract to rendezvous and uh, capture a B-class asteroid and wrangle it over and get it into orbit around the moon. Uh, yeah, well, one step at a time. The first thing we got to do is get ourselves uh, into an intercept trajectory with this asteroid, and that's what the launch course is all about, and that's why I am launching into a particular inclination, and I'll show you that in just a little bit. Um, when you're doing these asteroid rendezvous, you like to get one that is coming as close to Kerbin as it possibly can. And uh, I'll show you the trajectory in just a little bit, but you'll see that this one is actually uh, Kersmacking Kerbin. So you certainly can't get any closer than that. Now the reason why you want to get one that's coming in close is because if you're going to get a capture, the closer that you are to the body about which you want to get your capture, the cheaper your capture is going to be. So you don't want to get a trajectory that misses Kerbin by a, a long, long way. You want to get one that's close. So actually, that trajectory coming in is a great asset to you for rendezvousing with the asteroid because that's the trajectory that the asteroid is going to be coming into Kerbin's sphere of influence with. So that's the trajectory at which you want to go out if you want to rendezvous with it. So uh, what you want to do is time warp and rotate, you know, watch ro Kerbin rotate until the point where your launch site is below that particular trajectory. And then you want to launch into an inclination Put yourself into a low orbit that will be at roughly the same angle that that trajectory is at. And then once you are in low orbit, you can plan your transfer out to the asteroid at your leisure. But uh, okay, we've now lost all our liquid boosters. This thing is getting pretty close to main engine cutoff. Let's take a look at how we're doing with our trajectory. So you can see them asteroids trajectory there in blue, and there we are going the other way and. Well, I don't know, for eyeballing it and just putting in a number, I can't complain. That's looking pretty close to me. Yeah, I'm a little disappointed with that 40 degree inclination because I do have to get this thing around the moon, so it would have been much, much more convenient if the uh, asteroid was coming in with a much, much smaller inclination. Oh, there go our main engines. Because then it would be easier to get it into an orbit that will eventually intercept with the moon. But, uh, well, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. I also was taking a look at uh, Kerbal Engineer's rendezvous data. And notice there that it has a relative inclination of 2.1 degrees um, to, with the target. But that's not really right because that is, you know... Uh, the asteroid is still in an orbit around the sun, so it's considering our orbit around the sun, which is really Kerbin's orbit, so that's really the relative inclination between the asteroid and Kerbin's orbit. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, why don't we take a look at this uh, particular vehicle? All right, we are just about ready. There goes our booster. And we're just going to finish off circularization, and then we're going to be done. And, oh, wait a second. Uh... I have no torque. <laughs> I have a couple of reaction wheels. I'll explain why too in just a moment. But I turned off their torque during ascent. There we go. Now we're back. Uh, in order that so that the reaction wheels wouldn't be fighting with the reaction wheels that were on the lifter. But anyway, uh, onto this particular vehicle. This thing is packed with a little over 4,500 meters per second of delta V. It doesn't have to go particularly far but it does have to push quite a bit, so you do have to plan for that. Um, a B-class asteroid, the sort of upper end of its mass is going to be in around the 20 ton range, so you know, expect while this thing is coming back that it's going to have about another 20 tons stuck to the front of it. Now, to be fair, 
Um, most of the Delta V that you will be expending actually will be on your way out and with a rendezvous. Um, you're going uh, matching with an object in an orbit that's very close to Kerbin's orbit. These are all near Kerbin objects. <laughs> so NKOs, I suppose. Um, and so uh, really, your expenditure to get out to it is really not much more than what it takes to just exit Kerbin's sphere of influence. I like to budget in around uh, 11, 1200 meters per second in order to get out to my asteroid. Then once you're out there, you're going to have to pretty much kill that velocity off in order to match with it. Again, the asteroid is going at about the same velocity as Kerbin, so expect about another 1000 meters per second in order to do the rendezvous. Then you're going to latch onto it. And then you got to push it around. Now, because my trajectory is pretty close, well, not pretty close to Kerbin, it's going to hit Kerbin, um, all i got to do is push it out. And since I'm so far away from Kerbin by the time I match up with it, uh, pushing it out shouldn't cost too much, even with 20 tons stuck to the front of this thing. Um, and I'm going to arrow break this asteroid to capture it. So uh, that um, really shouldn't cost that much fuel. However, <laughs> I am going to have to change my inclination by about 40 degrees at some point. I am going to have to rendezvous and capture, um, get a capture around the moon. I can't arrow break around the moon, so all of that's going to cost a fair bit. And to be quite frank, I don't know. I was, I was just guessing it around the 4,500 meters per second. I might not have enough. But the thing is, is if I can get a Kerbin capture... I can deal with everything else later. If I want to send out some Kerbals to go and refuel this thing, I can do that. So, uh, you know, that's that's just getting the capture. That's going to be mission one. Everything else we can deal with when we get to it. Well, there we go. There are close encounter indicators already pretty close together there with only about a 950 meter per second prograde burn. I can see I'm still a little bit out as far as the plane goes and it needs to come out it looks like it looks has to come radially outwards a bit but uh you know so i, I started playing a bit with the normal component and the radial component uh, of this burn normally i just like to burn just pure prograde when i'm down in low curb in orbit but uh i just didn't want to get into getting multiple nodes going this time and besides uh, you can see here towards the end i ended up with a an additional 300 meter per second normal component and about 200 meters per second radial component but those two components only add on about less than 70 meters per second to the overall burn again remember that all of this stuff doesn't add on directly it adds up using the pythagorean theorem so uh combining burns together you know perhaps if i did it way out there it would have been a little cheaper than this but not much and now i can get it all out of the way with just a single burn Okay, this is getting entirely too twitchy. Let's get this over with. I can, um, you know, I'm going to have to do a correction burn at some point anyway to fine-tune the encounter. So this is about as close as I'm going to get it from here. So uh, let's get out to uh, getting close to our burn. Uh, and I will point out that uh, the nav balls decided it was going to lie to me on this one. Uh, the nav ball is telling me that my estimated burn time is 1 minute and 51 seconds. And I didn't notice this at the time, I wish I did, but Kerbal Engineer, meanwhile, is telling me it's 3 minutes and 6 seconds, which actually turned out to be closer to being right, because as soon as the burn started, yeah, now, now the nav ball's going, oh, oh, did I mean uh, 1 minute and 51 seconds? No, I meant really around 3 minutes and 20 seconds, so <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> anyway, so I started this burn uh, a little later than I should have. And as this burn is going to take a few minutes now, why don't we talk a little bit about the design of this thing. So, right at the front, of course, I have the grabber unit uh, that I've had unlocked for a while, but this is my first asteroid mission, first reason to use it. I actually don't like using it for uh, catching spacecraft and that kind of thing. It, it does not seem like a gentle way to connect things together, and we'll see that when we get to the actual point where we rendezvous with the asteroid. Now, right behind the grabber unit, I have two sets of reaction wheels. So usually you like to put the reaction wheels close to the center of mass of the vehicle. Uh, so you might be wondering why way up at the front and why two of them? Well, because you gotta remember that I'm gonna have to be doing some maneuvering with uh, upwards of 20 tons of rock stuck to the front of this thing. Um, the center of mass will be well inside the asteroid, so 
putting those things as far to the front of the vehicle gets them as close to the center of mass as I can and because it's going to be 20 tons <laughs> I want a lot of torque so I put two of them on there and speaking of maneuvering and turning asteroids around this thing's also equipped with a respectable amount of RCS now part of that is going to be for the actual connection which will be a lot like docking once you see it but part of it as well is going to be about turning the asteroid around and because I want torque I actually put more thruster blocks towards the after back end of the vehicle than I normally would. You can see here at the back that I have six thruster blocks. I don't need that for maneuvering and for connecting to the asteroid. I need that for trying to turn the asteroid around. And I put a, quite a fair amount of monoprop onto this thing. Yeah, at the front there is one of those 1.25 meter uh, monoprop tanks. Uh, holds 250 units what are the units by the way for for fuel I, I would always assume that they would be kiloliters but I could be wrong on that but anyway whatever they are I have 250 of them which is a fair amount uh, more than I need for docking with the asteroid but of course what I have them for is for uh, for turning the asteroid around and for maneuvering it as well and if anything I might have been a little chintzy on and I kind of wish now I went with a little bit more monoprop but I's got what I's got now so why don't we make our way over to the end of this particular burn. Okay, there we go. So there we go. My close encounter is uh, within 12,000 kilometers. That's a little over 11 days from now. I know that seems like a big separation, but from this kind of distance it really isn't. And we'll close that, uh, we'll close that gap once I'm outside of Kerbin's sphere of influence, I'll set up another maneuver node and we'll close that gap. And speaking of which, that won't be for about another five and a half days. So we will be revisiting that ves this vessel in a future episode. But now we're going to be moving on to uh, something else. So here we have Stala and Bob. And oh wait, I'm sorry, it's not Stala at all. Of course, it's Stala! Stella and Bob aboard the Otter 3. Uh, you've seen this vessel a few times before. It's my handy dandy high altitude jet plane with those vector engines on the back that you uh, can use the afterburners on to get to high altitude. And that's actually the main part of this mission is I want to get my new atmospheric scanner up to high altitude, but I'm spending too much time playing around with the uh, Action Group Extended mod talk about this mod in some episode in the future but right here all I'm doing is playing around trying to figure out I don't know I'm not doing much of anything at all so I finally said the heck with it let's hit R activate those turbo uh, afterburners that's the whoa 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 oh dear oh 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 that's pretty <laughs> so that I suppose is what you would call an afterburner fail yeah you see the way they work is uh, they really do depend on speed um, they depend on speed to compress and accelerate that air the faster you go the more effective they are and right there I was just going too slow to make those afterburners effective and they just kind of puttered out on me right uh, yeah at the end so <laughs> we'll have to just kind of try this again this time making sure to get myself up a good head of steam that ought to do it and we're off and I'm also going to be watching my thrust you can see up there with Kerbal Engineer it's telling me I'm up there getting up close there just cracked 80 kilonewtons so uh, what I want to make sure is that I don't let that thrust start to come too far down I want to continually be building up thrust and I do that by continually building up speed so I'm not just going to pitch up and go straight up. I want to keep my speed going. And speaking of speed, I just cracked 300 meters per second. I don't want to be seeing that going down. And of course the magic number is to get to an altitude of 18 kilometers. 18 kilometers is a high upper atmosphere. There's the word I'm looking for. And oh, I don't have there, I need my surface data for sure. Oh, I actually have some Mach numbers there. Mach 1.25. And climbing. As long as my speed is climbing, these things are going to keep working for me. Yeah. 
Let's see what happens if I pitch up just a little bit more. I've actually not played too much around with these. When I first built this thing, I turned them on and said, Ooh, that's cool. <laughs> so this is my first time actually using them for something productive. But I am certainly getting there. Altitude is now 17 kilometers. I should say as well that uh, I'm actually thinking of potentially retiring this plane. I do have now nuclear thermojet engines that come from uh, Kerbal Interstellar Extended. And uh, I've been playing around with them and they are super cool. But uh, it's money. <laughs> I want to upgrade my research and development center and I'm just really chintzing out and I'm going to be reusing old craft still for a while when I while I can. So uh but but in the future soon, I promise. Nuclear propulsion's coming. Okay. 18 kilometers. Let's do that atmospheric analysis. There we go and suck that up. Okay. So that is now accomplished. Do not need those afterburners anymore. I actually burned less fuel than I thought I would. I thought that would burn through the fuel a lot uh, more quickly. Yeah, or it actually burned through the fuel much less than I thought it would. So that's good because the second part of this is to get myself up to that north polar ice cap. Yeah, that's a biome that I have not yet gotten this atmospheric scanner to. So uh, let's get over there. And I'll save you the drudgery of the 48-minute flight out here. Uh, and instead, just show you the landing and show you that collecting the science went without any issue whatsoever. I also collected, uh, of course, the uh, atmospheric scan above the uh, ice cap and also caught the atmospheric scan above the nearby tundra biome as well. I'll also point out as you're watching this uh, touchdown, that, um, dang it, it struck again with another stuck control surface. That's the third time. Uh, twice in a row, because it happened in the last episode as well with my last plane. And uh, that got me sort of thinking, oh, what the hell is going on with dang it? Then I started thinking about it, and dang it does model the age of parts. As parts get older, um, they become more likely to fail. And uh, Kerbal Construction Time keeps said part in a parts inventory so it could very well be that all of these parts that are on this particular plane are all considered to be actually very very old even though this plane keeps getting rebuilt over and over and over again and so that might be why I'm starting to see so many failures now I was thinking about what I could do about this and one of the things that occurred to me was uh, perhaps I can just delete parts from the part inventory it turns out you can only delete the entire part inventory or uh, just leave it the way it is. There's no option to delete individual parts. So I didn't, yeah, that, that that's not going to help. I don't want to delete the entire part inventory because that really does cut down on my build times. Um, so what I'm thinking about is I could put a plane onto the runway, use an engineer to go over all of the parts, repair them, or not repair them, but uh, you can inspect them and uh, that I, I don't know I think that I'm hoping that might add some longevity to these parts we'll see how it goes of course it would help if all my engineers weren't in space right now but uh, well yeah that is what it is we'll have to wait till I have an engineer back down onto the surface anyway uh, and then it was time to get this thing back of course and uh, you know with some careful fuel management I was able to get it back to the Kerbal Space Center without too much trouble but uh, if you recall from last episode I attempted a landing in the water and that was because of dang it once again uh, another stuck control surface and uh, well by the way if you're wondering why I'm actually not having nearly the kind of problem you've seen me have before with dang it and control surfaces uh, because this time when the dang it alarm came up I decided to leave my control surfaces alone. <laughs> I didn't get into trying to tweak uh, what the various control surfaces are doing. I just kind of left it all alone, and uh, yeah, it is a lot better. This thing does have a slight tendency to want to roll again, but uh, it it is certainly uh, manageable as you you've been seeing. So um, anyway. After uh, that one landing in the water to collect some science, it didn't go so well because, well, it was a bit of a Kraken attack, I suppose is the way you would have to describe that. And I never did get the science out of the water. I thought, you know what, I'm going to use this thing to try and see if I can get that uh, atmospheric science out of the water now. If uh, 
he might be thinking that uh, I'm perhaps uh, pulling the tail of the dragon here just a little bit. Yeah, well, maybe, but uh, let's just see how this goes. Alright, we're down. Everything good so far, but of course, before, I didn't really get into trouble until I started EVAing my Kerbals. But right now, this seems to be okay. Now, Bob's going to have to go out and get that science data from the atmospheric scanner. So let's go do that. Okay, so far, so good. You can do a surface sample. Well, that makes no sense. Why could I get so much science from a surface sample? Like It's like I never did one before, but I know for a fact I've done water surface samples before. I don't know. Whatever. I'll take it. So let's go get the science here from our from our scanner. Download data. Okay. And we'll get Bob back inside. Trying to minimize our outside exposure to various... Ah! Oh, okay. That was okay. That was just a little splash. Don't know why that happened. <laughs> a random Kraken splash. But still no sign of a Kraken. All right, I think maybe things would best be served just to uh, get the heck out of here. So we'll recover, and we're done. And I think we're not only done for this particular mission, but I think for this episode as well. I thank you for watching, and hope to see you next time.